whether you're building a new home or adding on, framing up the situation or putting a roof over your head. If you need to rock it, roll it, or just get on with it, Home Time has a video to help you do it right. Transform your small bathroom into a luxurious master bath or increase your home's value by updating your old kitchen. Keep your drains draining, your switches switching, and your footing firm. Whether you do it yourself or buy it yourself, Home Time's how-to video guides will help you get the results you want. We'll make your next project a success. See your local home improvement retailer for the Home Time video that's right for you. Hi, and welcome to Home Time. I'm Dean Johnson. And I'm Robin Hartle. In this videotape, we'll be showing you a variety of drywall projects with step-by-step -step instruction on hanging the drywall and on finishing the seams. We'll also show you some special drywall situations that you may encounter in your own projects. And all that starts right after this. Home Time is made possible by Chevy Full Size Pickup, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickup on the road. The National PBS Series Home Time is made possible by the Stanley Works. Since 1843, Stanley has been committed to building quality tools and other products to help you do things right. At Home Time, we believe the best way to get the job done is to use the finest tools. And this Chevy full-size pickup is one of our favorites. Equipped with an optional Vortec 5700 V8 engine, it generates 255 horsepower and 330 foot-pounds of torque to power you through the toughest jobs. And with the optional third door, you've got lots of room for all your other tools. And friends to help you use them. At home or on the job site. For work or play, it's no wonder we at Home Time count on Chevy full-size pickups. The most dependable, longest-lasting full-size pickups on the road. The term drywall refers to a building product officially known as gypsum board. It replaced plaster as the most common ceiling and wall covering about 30 or 40 years ago. The sheets consist of a gypsum core, which is similar to plaster, and a thick paper surface on the front and the back. The paper on one side is coarse, and that goes against the framing. The finish side is smooth, and it accepts paint or wallpaper after the proper preparation. For this ceiling, we're using panels that are 4 feet wide, which is the standard width, and 12 feet long. We've rented a special drywall lift to help us work on the ceiling here. You'll see more on its operation later in the tape. We use it to raise the sheets up to the ceiling framing and to hold it while we nail in the edges. In a typical job, you nail the edges in and screw in the middles. That gives you a quick idea of some drywall basics. What we want to do now is show you a project Dean did with Joanne Liebler, where they go into more detail on the steps involved in hanging drywall. Okay, okay let me get over here and let's flip her upside. A couple of things to check for before you start installing drywall. You want to protect any wires or pipes that are in the walls from being pierced by the drywall screws or nails, and from anyone that tries to nail into the stud later. Small metal plates should go over any wires or pipes that are within one and a quarter inch of the edge of a stud. This is a code requirement. And you want to make sure that there are nailers at every corner. No edge of drywall should go unsupported for more than two feet. There are several types of drywall. It comes in different sizes, thicknesses, and with many different properties. And there's more of an explanation on this in our project guide. But for the most part, our work will be with 4 by 8 sheets of drywall that are a half inch or 5 eighths inch thick. When you order your materials, make sure you have them delivered to the room where they're needed. Your supplier will usually have a truck with a boom on it, and you can actually bring the sheets in through a second story window. Nineteen and eight. When you start hanging your sheetrock, or rocking as some people call it, you start on the ceiling and you run perpendicular with the framing. Now we've got a vapor barrier up here because we're on the second floor working on some exterior walls. And we've measured over from the corner to the center of this truss. So when we make the cut on the drywall, the edge will fall right in the middle. Did you get that? Okay, I've got it. The specialized tool called the drywall T-square will help make sure we get nice straight cuts. What I do is just move it over to the mark 
get it in position like so, and I take my utility knife and run that along the edge. So, with a good sharp blade, it doesn't take much pressure to score the drywall. Then I give the drywall a quick snap. It should break apart right at the cut. And to finish it off, I just cut the paper on the back of the break. Before we put any drywall on the ceiling, I've marked the location of where each truss is on the top of the wall. Once the rock is up, we'll need to know where to nail. These marks will help us. Attaching drywall to the ceiling is probably the toughest part of the whole drywall project. A 4 by 8 sheet of 5 8 inch drywall weighs 58 pounds. And it's a real awkward shape to hold over your head. So here's a good do-it-yourselfer trick. Build jacks like these out of two by fours. There's a diagram in the project guide to help you. Okay. So the jacks hold the drywall in place, finish side down while we nail it. This is a point where our specialized drywall hammer comes in handy. Notice the head is convex. This creates a little dimple around the nail head without breaking the paper on the surface of the drywall. This will allow us to cover the nail head with drywall mud and get a perfectly smooth surface. And we always start nailing in the middle of the edge and work out toward either end. It's important to hold the drywall tight to the wood behind it as you nail. Don't count on the pressure of the hammer to snug it up to the framing. These are special drywall nails. They have ring shanks, which in theory hold into the wood a little better. Standard length is one and a quarter inch for half inch drywall and one and three eighths inch for five eighths inch drywall. Okay, Drew, I'll get this brace out over here and nail this in. Okay. Along the short side, where the drywall is backed by framing all the way along the edge, we put nails in every eight inches. Our second sheet will fill in the rest of the way to the wall. Okay, there we go. That looks pretty good. Here. When you're nailing the edges of a piece of drywall, make sure that the nail is at least three-eighths of an inch back from the edge. Any closer and the drywall might fracture. And the joints between pieces of drywall don't have to be perfect. They should be snug. But you may find that where two cuts meet, there may be small gaps. And these are OK. Now we're ready to measure and cut our third piece, okay, which starts our second right? row. This row starts at the other end of the room from the first row. And this is so the butt joints between the sheets don't line up from row to row. Now this is the first sheet that we have to measure and cut for a light fixture. And it's nice having a partner to help out on this. Joe, figure six and a half for the diameter. Six and a half. All righty. Got 20, that. And 28 and a quarter from the end of the sheet. All right. And 28 and a quarter, so that would be 31 and a half. 38 and a half from the side. I'm sorry, 38 and a half? Yep, 38 and a half from the side. 41 and three quarters. Now for cutting holes in drywall, we have a special tool called a circle cutter. And I've already adjusted it so it's at the proper diameter. And now we've also located and marked the center of the hole on the drywall. So now we can just make our cut. You turn it around a few times and it scores the outline you want in the drywall. Then you can break the piece out with a hammer. Okay, a little bit further. Let me get it tight up against the sheet here. A little bit further, Jojo. Okay, square to the room. There, how's Perfect. that? That's good. Right. Just a little bit. If the electrical roughing's been done properly, the bottom of the fixture should be fairly close to flush with the bottom of the sheetrock. So you can see it's important to know the thickness of the sheetrock before you install your fixtures and boxes during the electrical roughing. Oh, 
I'm going to have to move the bod. This is too long. Oh, Look at that. It. Okay, I'll turn it back down. All right, get your hand ready. This is coming down. I got it. There we go. Now, this piece was cut a little too long, Dean. So at moments like this, it's handy to have an open screen rasp. And then you can just shave a little bit off the side until the piece fits. Like so. Why don't you give it a kick? Thank you. Okay, we have to get it over this whole thing. Okay, I know how to do it there. Now, making a cut along the length of the drywall can sometimes present a few problems. First of all, you're probably not going to find a T-square that's eight feet long. You can find a straight edge hole that's long enough. You can hold that against the sheet and then run your knife along the top of that. Or you could snap a chalk line and then use that to guide your knife. Unfortunately, sometimes the blue or red chalk will bleed through the paint once the wall's painted. The method we prefer using is to take our tape measure and mark the measurement using our left hand. And with our utility knife, we place that at the end of the blade, lay that up against the drywall, and start scoring the bottom edge. Now, as we do this, we'll end up with an exact 18-inch measurement. Now, it's important as we do this to make sure that we keep our tape parallel to the end of the sheet. We don't want any motion like this at all going on. This will give you a pretty straight cut. It's not super accurate, but it's good enough when you're hanging drywall. Building codes and common sense will tell you that you need more than just nails along the edges to support each piece of drywall. So we're securing it in the field, three places along each truss. One way to do this is to double nail. Two nails go in about two inches apart. That means six more nails along each truss. And you have to eyeball where you nail pretty carefully to make sure you hit the truss. If you like, you can stretch a string between the marks to make sure you hit the framing. An alternative to nailing is to use drywall screws and a screw gun. Screwing is faster and a little stronger, so with screws you need less fasteners. Generally, you need either one screw or two nails every 12 inches along the framing, but check the project guide for exceptions to this rule. We use 5 8 inch drywall on the ceiling because our trusses were 24 inches on center. For 16-inch ceiling framing, you can use half-inch drywall. In fact, most walls use half-inch. To drywall walls, you start with a piece across the top of the wall. We've already cut this piece to length so that the edge will fall in the middle of a stud. And we've pre-nailed across the top in line with the stud. Now it's just a matter of lifting this piece up flush with the ceiling pieces. Okay. Yeah. All right, it looks pretty good. You don't have to wait until all the sheets are up before you go back and put your screws or nails in the field. There you go. In fact, in some ways, it's easier to do it now while you can still use the stud to line up where the screw should go on the sheet. OK, 
Okay, Joe, it's 34 and 5 eighths to the top and 38 and 5 eighths to the bottom. Okay, 38 and 5 eighths? Right. All right. As we get the first piece for the bottom of this wall ready, we can show you another tool that's used in drywall work, the keyhole saw. With a keyhole saw, you punch the tip through the rock to begin sawing. This is the best tool to use to cut holes for rectangular electrical boxes. Punch the saw in at the corner to cut along each side. A standard eight foot ceiling is slightly over eight feet one inch between the bottom of the ceiling joist and the subfloor, depending on what the subfloor is. So a combination of the five eighths inch drywall and the ceiling and these two four foot sheets still leaves us with a gap of about three quarter inches. So we're going to put that gap on the bottom of the wall here where it'll get covered up with baseboard and we'll have a snug joint right here between the two horizontal pieces of drywall. And these levers are designed to lift the drywall up from the floor. There are some situations you want to be aware of when hanging drywall. When working around windows and doors, you want to avoid creating a vertical joint above the side of a window or door. Instead, you want to locate that joint in the middle of the opening. So that means we need to cut a corner, like so. And for that, we use another tool, a drywall saw. After getting a four or five inch start with the keyhole saw, we move on to the drywall saw. It's a short saw with coarse teeth. We use it to make the first cut on this corner, cutting the shorter side. Once the first side is cut, we cut the second side the normal way, scoring with a knife and then snapping the pieces apart. All ready? I'm ready. another way to cut out for an opening. Now we put an entire piece of drywall over this closet door opening and using the drywall saw and the framing as a guide we can just cut our outline. You run the saw along the framing. It doesn't matter if you scrape up the surface of a 2 by 4 a little bit. Okay, Dean. Okay. You got this one? You bet. Let's try on the other one over here. All right, Joe, four and a half inches. Okay. When working on closets like this, it's important to know ahead of time if you're going to have a full wood jam or a half jam. If you're going with a full wood jam, you just leave the sheetrock just the way it is. With a half jam, which is the way we're doing it, we'll still want to stick one more piece of sheetrock on. Pretty basic techniques, right? Yet yeah, what we've shown you in this room should cover 90% of the situations you'll run into in hanging drywall. And for that other 10%, we'll take you to a remodeling project that we're doing. I've got this. Okay. Starting with some oddly shaped pieces in this situation, this room has what's called a trade ceiling. We install the angled pieces on the sides first and then rock the flat area in the center. Okay. Cutting angled pieces like this requires some special measuring. This piece is already cut the width and length. Now we want to take it from this piece down to the bottom in the corner. And the first measurement we take is from our last piece to where the angle begins. 
Okay, Joe, 19 and a quarter for that one. All right, 19 and a quarter, you say? We transfer that dimension to the okay, sheet. Chalk? Normally, you try to avoid using a chalk line to mark drywall, because a chalk will sometimes bleed through the paint on the surface. But for this angle, it. it's about the only way. Right there? Yep. Here's a tool that you might want to consider wrenching for your drywall work. It's an adjustable aluminum bench, and it gives you that extra height in working with the ceiling. I've got it on my end here. What do you got? Eight feet, three and a half inches. Mm, a little wide, huh? A little bit. The width across this flat portion of the ceiling is eight feet, three and a half inches. So if we were to use two four foot wide sheets of drywall, we'd have a leftover strip about three and a half inches wide. So rather than do that, we use a full sheet in the middle and two narrower strips on the side. The first piece along one side is ripped to about two feet wide, and we install it with a cut side along the outside edge of the area. The second piece is a full four feet wide. And the last piece is cut narrower, about 27 inches. When mixing full sheets and sheets that have been trimmed along the longer edge, it's important to put the tapered factory edges together and the cut edges along the outside of the area that you're hanging. Okay, now we're ready for the walls. There's one little thing we want to remember. This is a pocket door frame, and once we install the drywall over the top of it, a door will slide in and out of this pocket. When we go to install the drywall, we don't want to use screws or nails longer than an inch. They're going through a half inch of drywall and three quarters of an inch of frame. So we don't want the tips of the screws coming through this frame and scratching the door as it slides in and out. You want me to hold that? Up till now, we've been using regular drywall, but in a bathroom situation like this, you might want to use a special type of drywall that's usually called green board. Well, green board is a type of drywall that's water resistant, so it's sometimes labeled WR. Now, that doesn't mean that it's waterproof, but it does hold up better than regular drywall if it comes in contact with water, so it's good around a tub. Because this is a whirlpool tub, we'll only run it up four feet around the tub. If this were a combination tub and shower, we'd probably run it up to the top of the wall. Another product that installs kind of like drywall is the cementinous backer board. It's concrete sandwiched between two layers of fiberglass, and it's an excellent underlayment for ceramic tile. Now, this is a pretty specialized product, so if you're thinking about using it, you might want to check out our ceramic tile tape for proper installation instructions. Remodeling situations in older homes like this one will often present you with this problem. There will be a spot where you have to fill in for some missing plaster, like we have above the tub here. Plastering is getting to be sort of a dying art. There aren't many people that know how to do it, and it takes a long time to master. Luckily, we can use drywall up in this area. Now, the plaster here is a half inch thick, plus we have the thickness of the lath. If we take a scrap piece of lath like so and put that on the bottom of the joist, a half inch sheet of drywall should be nice and flush with our ceiling. The old plaster has to be cut off cleanly. You need a straight edge to butt the new piece of drywall up to. If you've prepared everything right, putting up the drywall itself is simple. There we go. Good. 
Now, unless you happen to be a giant, getting drywall up to the ceiling can be tough. So if you've got high ceilings, it might make sense to rent one of these rigs. This is called a drywall lift. The way it works is you load the sheet on, and then you level it out to the ceiling like so. This little lock in place. Pull down these little arms, and then move it over to the area where you'll be installing it. Well, like so. You get it really close in. And then start cranking it back up to the ceiling again. Like so. And then reposition it one last time. That yeah, looks pretty good right That's there. Good. And snug it up against the ceiling. There. That looks good, Joe. Right there, Joe. All right. Bring it up. Now, if you do rent equipment like this, be sure to get complete instructions from the rental center on its operation. Now, we have a few peculiarities here with the ceiling. You're going to run into these in just about any remodel situation. We have a steel beam running down the middle of the room. So we find our sheets of drywall to bridge the gap over the beam. You'll find this isn't the greatest nailing surface. <laughs> There we go. Now you got it. There we go. Now over here where the old house meets the addition, the joists run in different directions. So we want our sheetrock to run in different directions too. The goal of course is to have your sheetrock running perpendicular to your joists. Now the area along here will see some movement. So we don't want to put the joint bar sheetrock right here. It could crack. So we'll just move the joint down a joist. Okay, are you okay. ready for this? You bet. Go ahead. Crank it up. Well, like so? Yeah. Are you tight down there, Joe? Yep. Okay. Well, we have one tricky spot left. Eventually, this pipe here will be covered with a soffit. We'll drive all over the top of that. But for the time being, we want to rock inside of the soffit as a fire stop. This is in case if there's ever a fire in the soffit here. It can't spread up through the floor joist and then throughout the room. So this is a little bit of a cut and paste job, but we don't care what it looks like because eventually it will be covered by the soffit. Oh, nine foot two. Well, obviously, 4 by 8 sheets of drywall work best in rooms where the ceilings are only 8 feet high. But many ceilings are higher, either by design or, in our case, where the floor and ceiling heights are tied into the older part of the house. Now, you may be tempted to buy 10-foot sheets, rip them down to 9-foot, too, and then run them vertically. But it's best not to do this. You should really try to run your wall perpendicular to the framing. So that gives us a strip that's about 14 inches wide. And where you place these sin strips, or rippers as they're sometimes called, depends on several factors. We'll be doing a couple walls and showing you a couple different ways of doing it. If the ripper is going across the top of the wall, the cut edge has to go up against the ceiling. We put a full sheet up now on the next row down. This way, we can measure and cut accurately for the second ripper along the top. Perfect. We lift the bottom piece into place with foot levers and leave about a half inch gap at the base of the wall. There we go. Hold on. There we go. Now here's what we've decided to do on these three walls. On this wall, we put the ripper up near the ceiling. Now we could have just as easily put it down by the floor. It totally depends on where you feel like working when you tape the joints. So we've got a joint here and a joint at about waist height. And we decided to work at these levels rather than come down and work on a joint here, which is where the joint would be if the ripper was here. Here on the back wall, we put the ripper on the bottom. This way the fireplace breaks up our joint, we end up taping two short joints rather than a long one across the entire wall. 
And here on the third wall, we put a full sheet in the middle and slightly narrower sheets on the top and the bottom. This way, both joints are broken up by the windows and the door, so we have less taping to do. There's one other situation to consider, and that's if you have a thin ripper, let's say two or three inches wide. You might consider putting that in the middle of the wall. This way, rather than having two individual joints to tape, you can treat it as one joint. The only downside to this is you'll have a cut end butting up to a factory edge. Just a little bit harder to tape is all. Heavy. Well, it sure beats carrying around those 60-pound sheets of rock, don't you think? Yeah, I'm glad that part of the job's over. Now, the outside corners of drywall can be damaged fairly easily, so we'll protect these with this metal corner bead, and to install this, we'll use this metal clinching tool. It clinches the bead into the drywall by bending down these little fingers. The clincher only attaches the corner bead to the drywall, so we think in addition to that, it's a good idea to nail through the corner bead into the framing. For a wider angle on a corner like this, I have to spread the corner bead a little to match the angle. Once the drywall is hung, you're halfway done, but there are a few steps to getting a new wall to its finished form, taping, mudding, and sanding. The idea is to fill in the joints between the drywall sheets with joint compound and to reinforce them with a paper tape. Once that dries, another coat of drywall compound is applied, followed by a third finishing coat. Then it's all sanded smooth for priming and painting. We moved through that part of the process pretty quickly here, so let's go back to that previous project for more details from Dean and Joanne. If hanging drywall is a science, then finishing the joints is an art. Joint compound, or as professionals call it mud, is applied in several layers to cover up the joints, the corner bead, and the fasteners. Well, the art comes in using the different size taping knives to get a smooth surface. Is that stuff ready? All set. There are several different types of joint compound, and they come pre-mixed or powdered. We're using a pre-mixed all-purpose for all of our coats. Now, you can mix this by hand, but it is a lot of work. You might want to do yourself a favor and rent, borrow, or buy one of these, a half-inch drill with a paddle mixer. That's because you need to stir the mud lightly every time you open the container. But don't stir too much. This can work air into the mud, and that could create little craters and bubbles on your wall surface. Drywall has a tapered edge along the long side of the sheet. When these two edges are butted together, they form a little valley called a recessed joint. This is different from a butt joint where the two square corners meet. Our objective here is to fill in this little recessed joint with drywall compound and tape to give us a nice smooth surface. The first coat is called a tape coat, and that's because we embed this paper joint tape in every joint and in every corner. First, we spread out a layer of mud over the joints. For this first coat, I use a taping knife that's five or six inches wide. I'm generous with the mud at this point. I spread out more than I need to fill the trough formed by the tapered edges. A trick to spreading out mud is to hold the knife more perpendicular to the drywall when it's full of mud, and then flatten it out as you move along the joints. This spreads the mud out evenly over the whole stroke of the knife. When the mud is on, I lay out a piece of joint tape over the center of the joint. I press it in lightly by hand. I only need to make it stick to the mud at this point. Then I go back and flatten the tape into the mud, working from the center of the joint out to the sides. You can use pretty firm pressure with this stroke, and you end up scraping off some excess mud. Just make sure to leave mud under the tape. As you tape, keep your knife clean. Constantly scrape it off on the side of the pan. Mud that stays on your knife will dry out faster. My last step at this point is to spread a very thin layer of mud out on top of the tape. This requires a gentle touch. The tape should still be visible through the mud. And don't worry too much about a few grooves and streaks on the surface now. There will be more coats to smooth it out. For now, we treat the recessed joints and butt joints the same. 
Once all the joints are done, we can mud in the corner beads. If the corner bead's been installed properly, there should be a little valley between the metal ridge and the surface of the drywall. So while we're putting on our first tape coat, we'll mud this area too. I troweled the mud on, one side at a time, using the corner bead to pull the mud off the knife. Then I run the knife down the side at about a 45 degree angle, resting it against the ridge of the corner bead. I scrape off anything that rises above that level. You want a band of mud about four to six inches wide on either side of the bead, and since there will be little drops of it that accumulate along the edge, you should scrape those off too. We also want to apply tape along the tops of the walls and in the corners. The theory is the same as on the flat joints, it's just that you put mud on one side at a time. Once there's mud on both sides of the corner, I fold the joint tape in the center. And most brands come with a crease here to make this easier. Then the tape fits into the corner. When the tape's in place, I run a knife down each side to set it in the mud and to work out any excess. And we lightly coat each side before we leave it to dry. Now the last thing we need to do at this point is cover all the screw and nail heads. And remember, these are all sunk just slightly below the surface, so it won't take much mud to cover them. I trowel on more than I need, covering a row of screws in one stroke. I use a five or six inch knife almost flat to the wall, and I gently scrape off the excess. And this leaves a very thin layer of mud all the way up and down the wall here. The mud around the screw heads will shrink a little bit, so we'll keep coming back and mudding over them, two more times in fact. Every so often you'll run into what's called a clicker. Hear that? And that happens when a screw or a nail isn't sunk below the surface enough. Now if it's a nail, many knives are going to come with a hammerhead and you can just kind of beat it into shape like that. Otherwise, you're going to want to keep a screwdriver handy. That's better. Let's try this again. When you finish your tape coat, you need to let it dry at least overnight. And before you leave the work area, be sure to clean your tools thoroughly and throw away any excess mud that might be left over in your pans. Scrape off the sides of the mud bucket so the pieces don't harden. Brush down the sides and along the top, and add a little water right on top of the mud. This keeps it from drying out. If you don't clean your tools real well, you can end up with nubs of dried mud. It'll end up leaving grooves on your next coats. And we'll start those coats tomorrow, right after this first one's had a chance to dry. leveled off all of our surfaces, the nail dimples, the joints, and the corners. So now everything's pretty even. The next couple of coats will make everything smooth, and we're using larger knives, 7 to 10 inches. And we apply the mud differently. We use a little less pressure and a little more patience. If I apply the mud and then just scrape it off, I haven't really added any mud to the area. This just doesn't help to smooth it out. We want to build the mud up along the middle of the joint and then feather it out to almost nothing along the edges. I use the 8 inch knife to put more mud on the joint and I smooth it out with a couple of strokes. One on each edge and one on the center. I put more pressure on the knife on the outside of the joint and I let it ride a little high at the center. 
The last stroke uses even pressure. The tape itself shouldn't be visible under the mud. This is just something you have to feel, and you get more confident after doing it a couple times. Remember that some of the joints are butt joints. This means that there isn't a tapered edge on the drywall. And some of the tape and mud we've added already have created a little bit of a ridge. So to hide this ridge, we'll taper out the joint a little bit further than we do a normal joint. So using a 10 inch blade, we first put mud down either side of the joint, like so. Then putting pressure on my index finger, you run the blade down the left hand side. So, then putting pressure on my outside finger, you run it down the right hand side. And then we run the blade down the center of the joint. And then you might want to take one last gentle pass down each side, like so. The screw heads get another layer of mud at this point, too. The idea is just to put it on and scrape it off and to fill in any depressions that might have been made by the mud shrinking around the screw heads. Inside corners present another little problem that requires a special approach. Once we've feathered one side, it's difficult to work on the next side without disturbing the side you just worked on. But one way of handling this is with a corner knife. The corner knife runs right down the corner like so, smoothing both sides at the same time. Then we come in with a blade and just take off the slight ridge that it leaves. Another way to handle inside corners, the way the pros do it, is to do your second coat on one side, let it dry, and then come back and do the other side. Now this requires some planning. To use your time efficiently, there's a pretty standard plan of attack on what areas to do when. We set up this pattern, starting with our tape coat. Joints, outside corners, screw heads, and inside corners. For the second and third coats, we do all the recessed joints, corner beads, screw heads, the butt joints, and half of the inside corners. Then we can come back and fill coat the other half of the inside corners. We stagger which sides of the inside corners we do so that one side gets to harden before we do the other side. Now before we put on the final coat, which is also called the finish coat, we scrape down the edges with a knife to smooth it out a little bit. This removes any ridges or tool marks. We want as smooth a base as possible for our third coat. We've been taking our mud pretty much straight out of the container, but many tapers like to thin their first coat or this last coat. It's really a matter of personal preference. If you do thin the mud, do it with about a cup of water at a time, and don't get the mud so runny that it falls off the knife. Too thin and you weaken the mud. Because we want to feather these joints out even farther, we'll be using bigger knives. You can use up to 8 inch knives on the screws and up to 12 inch on the joints. The finish coat is where you have to be a real artist. You don't want to leave any grooves or streaks here. It's a good idea to check your joints at this time too. If you hold your knife in the center of the joint and there's any play on either side of it, it means that you have a hump in the middle of the joint. And you'll want to feather that out a little bit. At this point, the mud on our flat joint should be about 12 inches wide. Our corner bead should have about 6 inches of mud. There should be about a 5 inch wide stripe of mud over the screw heads. 
Our butt joints can have as much as 18 to 24 inches of mud. And the inside corner should be feathered out about six inches. So are you ready for the ceiling? You betcha. The ceilings are the most exposed part of any drywall job. You usually don't see long, continuous stretches of walls. It's usually broken up by windows, doors, pictures, furniture, that sort of thing. Yeah, but the ceiling is just hanging up there with nothing to hide it. And depending on the lighting, that extra bit of mud you might use to hide a butt joint or a screw head, well, it could show up. So we're going to do a few extra things to our ceiling, and we have a couple of options. We're going to texture some of our ceilings, and we're choosing to go with a splattered type of texture here. We went to the sprayer for this. Now we're going to dump some joint compound in the hopper. The mud can be thinned down to as much as two parts mud to one part water, depending on how fine you want the texture. There are also special compounds just for texturing. As I spray the ceilings, the mud splatters out onto the drywall. And this is pretty messy work, so be prepared to get dripped on. Some of the splatter will get on the wall so we have to scrape up any overspray. Once the mud on the ceiling is set up for about 15 or 20 minutes, we gently go over it with a wide knife to flatten it out. There is more than one type of ceiling texture, and here's another type. By adding a special ceiling texturing compound, you can create a different effect. The compound is part mud, part paint, and part aggregate, a small particle like vermiculite. When this is splattered on the ceiling, it gives sort of a pebble-like effect. This doesn't get flattened out. What you see here is the final surface, but it will still be necessary to scrape the overspray off the walls. Here in the kitchen and family room area, we want a truly flat ceiling, so we need to add another layer of mud. This is called a skim coat. And what we'll do is put a very thin layer of mud across the entire ceiling. And we've prepared for the skim coat by sanding down all the mudded areas. There you go. To spread on this coat, I use a wide trowel. I spread the mud out over an area with a couple of strokes. And I go back and trowel most of the mud off. I'm not trying to build up the mud. Just put a thin layer over the whole area, especially those areas where there isn't any. It takes a very gentle touch to remove just the right amount of mud and to smooth out the little trowel marks that it creates. Generally, we advise first-time drywall do-it-yourselfers to stay away from this kind of ceiling. Okay, all done with that room. Well, good. We're in the home stretch of our drywall work. And one of the last steps is to sand down all the mud. This removes any lap marks or tool marks or any ridges that might be left over. And you can see that it's uh, pretty dusty and gritty work. In addition to using particle masks, we want to seal off this area from the rest of the house. The dust gets everywhere. We're using pole sanders here. The pad swivels at the end of the pole, which makes it possible to sand almost anywhere. We only sand the mudded areas. If the pad runs over the raw paper of the wallboard, it scuffs it up. You can use sandpaper here, 120 to 150 grit, but we're using this open screen. The screen works well because the dust doesn't build up in the grit, like it will with sandpaper. It falls out of the screen. Cleaning up is a significant part of drywall work. When we were done rocking, there was a lot of scrap and dust to remove. And there's even more to clean up now.
Jojo, now we're at this stage. Doesn't it feel like we finally accomplished something? Yeah, it does. One thing that's kind of odd about the drywall stage of any project is all the rooms start feeling a little smaller. All that open framing tends to be a bit deceiving. But once the drywall's up, the rooms really start to take shape. We hope we've made the process of installing and finishing drywall clear, although it is hard work. But we think a couple of people can handle a project this size. But working on an entire home is a whole other story again. We think the best thing to do here is hire a good crew, stand back, and watch them do the work. This is a 2,700 square foot home. The roof lines on the outside create some interesting vaulted ceilings on the inside. On a project like this, where we're building in the winter, it's important to get the heating system in and running. That's because the temperature inside needs to be at least 55 degrees for the mud to set properly. In fact, a well-ventilated 70 degrees is ideal. And this high vaulted ceiling here in this part of the house is a good reason to have professional hangers hang the sheetrock, rather than doing it yourself. Many professional rockers are paid by the square foot, so if there's a way to make the work go faster, these guys have it figured out. Here we can see that they're using a router to cut holes for the electrical fixtures. This is a pretty sophisticated technique. They run the router around the outside of the box to create a hole that's just slightly larger than the fixture. Well, it sure looks like these guys have done this before. You've got to do this every day to develop that smooth technique with a screw gun. It didn't take them long to get this up, huh? Yeah, all this in five days, that's pretty good. Now, we're using a special type of drywall here. You'll notice that it has a rounded edge, so there's more of a gap. That means that we can get a little extra mud in here. The theory is it'll make the joint a little bit stronger. It also means an extra sip now that we're ready to tape. This is called the joint coat, or pre-filling. The tapers use a chemically hardening mud here that dries in an hour or two. The mud is also exceptionally hard. On butt joints, the tapers notch out a little extra at the joint so there's space for this joint coat. Then they apply just enough mud to fill the notch, but not the whole recessed joint. This round edge drywall is common mostly among professional contractors in the Midwest. And since this mud sets up quickly, the tape coat can start right away. Another tool commonly used by professionals is called a banjo. This tool holds a roll of tape and a quantity of mud, so it coats the tape with mud as it dispenses it. When it comes to taping, a professional crew makes it look so easy. There's not a wasted movement. It's kind of like dancing. This comes with practice and experience, doing it every day. A do-it-yourselfer will probably never be able to make it look this easy by just doing a couple weekend projects. Contractors tell us it takes at least six months on the job before a taper truly becomes proficient. But don't let that discourage you. We believe if a do-it-yourself that takes the time and works carefully, you can achieve good results, even if it does take a little bit longer. For all the sweat that you put into hanging and taping your drywall, the wear and tear of everyday living just may damage it sometime down the road. So let's take a look at a couple repair techniques. Drywall doesn't crack like plaster, but it does leave holes, like this little accident here. With the plaster wall, you'll find a backing of lath under which you can fill the hole. With drywall, there's no backing between the studs, so patching it will require a different approach. There are two ways to do this. One way is to take a piece of cardboard, slightly larger than the hole, and tied to a length of string, insert it in the hole and pull taut. This creates a backing onto which you can apply patching compound. After the first coat of compound is dried, I can cut the string and go back and apply a second coat. With the second coat dry, you can apply some fiberglass tape to strengthen the patch. Cover with a layer of compound, feathering out around the hole with a wide bladed knife. Let it dry and sand smooth. Then in our case, we'd install a door stop to make sure this doesn't happen again. Another approach to use is called the hat patch method. 
The idea here is to insert a small piece of drywall the size of the hole with some paper backing to serve as the joint tape. The first step in this process is to clean the rough edges of the existing hole. Then I cut out the patch using a sharp utility knife and on the back side came in an inch, scored the circumference, and scraped off the gypsum, being careful not to tear off the facing paper. The next step is to apply joint compound to the hole in the wall. Then insert the patch, making sure it fits, and coat the seam around the overlap with two coats of joint compound, feathering out the edges to assure a smooth finish. Those are the basic steps to hanging, finishing, and repairing drywall. We have one more technique to show you before wrapping up. It's the textured ceiling treatment we used on this ceiling here. It's called a knockdown ceiling, and Dean handled this job just a few days ago. For our ceiling texturing up here, I'm using this gun to splatter on some thinned out drywall mud. Then later on, I'll come back and I'll flatten all this out. The gun is powered by a compressor, which we rented for this job. The drywall mud is poured into that blue hopper and blurps out in an uneven stream. That produces the random effect we're looking for. The gun can be adjusted for different effects, and polystyrene granules can be added to the mud for a different texture. It tends to splatter, but it can be cleaned off pretty easily with a taping knife. We're using a wipe down blade to skim the surface of the texture, to knock it down in other words. You don't want to scrape it off completely, so we leave a sixteenth of an inch to complete the knockdown effect. Texturing a ceiling works real well because you don't have to apply the finish coats of joint compound. And it is kind of hard to get a ceiling nice and smooth. It looks real good. Yeah, it looks nice. This should give you a good idea of how to tackle any drywall project that comes your way. I'm Robin Hartle. And I'm Dean Johnson. Thanks for watching. Home Time is made possible by Chevy Full Size Pickup, the most dependable, longest lasting full size pickup on the road. The National PBS Series Home Time is made possible by the Stanley Works. Since 1843, Stanley has been committed to building quality tools and other products to help you do things right.